This is the Trey Blocker Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trey Blocker Show. Today's special guest is Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. General Paxton was first elected to the Texas House of Representatives in 2002, the Texas Senate in 2012, and was just recently re-elected uh, Texas Attorney General this week. So welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. You know, usually I don't make it a point to say what the day is that we're recording these episodes because sometimes we don't know when we're going to air them. But we are now sitting here Friday morning after the Tuesday election. I'm just going to ask a really broad question. What's your takeaway from it? You know, it, it was definitely a mixed bag. We had, obviously, we held all our statewide positions, which was obviously excellent. And we lost in certain counties, um, our judicial and some of our state reps, a few senators, a few congressmen. Obviously, that's, that's not good, and we have some work to do. All right. So for the, for the listeners who haven't been paying attention as closely as we do to election cycles, Republicans in Texas are used to winning by a 20-point margin and not five-point margins. Yeah. So was it Beto O'Rourke? What factors do you attribute it to? A couple of factors. You know, midterm elections typically go against the party in power. Whoever has the presidency typically loses. It's been traditional. It's been historic for that to happen over time. So that isn't actually that surprising. Actually, we are, our losses, for instance, nationally were actually lower than average in, in, in Congress. But I also think Beto motivated a lot of people to get out to vote. We had a huge, massive turnout, and, and he did a good job getting voters out to vote. And it was actually very close to our presidential turnout two years ago. So I've already noticed in the press um, that they, the mainstream media is making the argument that this should be a wake-up call to Republicans that they need to moderate their views. Do you agree with that? <laughs> no. I, look, we don't, we don't have views because they're moderate, liberal, uh, conservative. We have views because they work. And we're going to adopt positions that are good for the people of Texas, not positions that are that sound good that you know we're, we're buying votes we're, we're, we take our positions on on principle and on what's what is the best policy for Texans right let's talk about President Trump how much of a factor do you think he was you know there's no doubt he, he it's just the way it is it doesn't it wouldn't matter that it was Trump or whether it was Obama if you'll remember when Obama was president his midterm election we went from 76 House Republicans in the Texas House up to almost 100. So it's not unusual. So definitely he, the president is a factor. And for some reason, Americans tend to, after two years of whatever president, tend to have some backlash. Right. Do you anticipate a bounce back in the next election cycle? You know, I, I would anticipate a bounce back. Um, I would expect that President Trump will get reelected, which will help Republicans two years from now, not just in Texas, but really all over all over the country. But, you know, it, it takes hard work. It takes organization. It takes fundraising. We're going to have to do our job and to make sure that that actually happens. Right. So changing topics on you, you just got elected to a second four-year term. What, what would you say your biggest accomplishments were during your first term? So a, a couple of things. Human trafficking was something that we started a unit, had never been done by the Texas Attorney General's office. A year into my first term, we started the Human Trafficking Transnational Crime Unit. And it's been pretty successful given its short duration. We've had many prosecutions. We shut down one of the, if not the largest, one of the largest online purveyors of prostitution and human trafficking in the country, which right. happened to be in Dallas. Right. And then we also... We were defending the Constitution. We were defending the state from the federal government, literally taking over every aspect of our, our economy and our society. We filed 27 lawsuits in the first 27 months against Obama, and we were successful in most of those. And, and that, I think, helped save the Constitution and save our economy. So on the human trafficking issue, I personally feel like there's not enough attention given to that issue and there's not enough press attention. So I don't think the general public sees it for what it is, which is a real crisis. So how do we change that? So we have, you know, with this new unit that we started, one of our main focuses is education. And so obviously we're going to prosecute it if we find it, but we are also trying to prevent it. And so we put out an hour long documentary that's really good. It's not your typical government video that's on our website. Um, 
And we also have, did a PSA with Matthew McConaughey that was really good. We're, we're just okay. trying to educate people about the warning signs, and we have all that information on our website. But we'll also send people out to talk to groups, and then we try to partner with them because we have to leverage the small amount of resources that we have to do this. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to stop human trafficking. But if we can leverage that and educate people, we really believe we can end human trafficking just like we ended human slavery in the 1860s. Right. So the legislature convenes January 8th of next year. Do you need additional resources from the legislature to fight this issue? Absolutely. We, they had actually not given us any resources. We kind of pieced this together with our existing resources. But there's no doubt that if we want to have a bigger impact on stopping this in our state, and I should remind your audience, you know, this is a, an issue that we're, we're the number two state in the, in the United States for human trafficking. Houston is the worst city. Mm -hmm. And so it is a real issue for Texas. And it doesn't just happen, you know, along the border. It happens all over the state. It happens in every town, every city. It's, 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 it's prevalent. California being the first, I would assume. So is, is it a proximity to the border, which is the main driver, I assume, even though it takes place all across yeah, the state? Yeah, I mean, state? part of it's population size. You know, we're okay. obviously the second largest population, so it kind of makes sense. And, you know, obviously we have ports and we have borders and all of that impacts us. Right. Going back to these lawsuits, 27 lawsuits against the federal government, were those all against Obama's administration or were there well, some against Trump as well? I, it was 27 and 27 months against the Obama administration. Okay. And then there have been 11 or so since then against the Trump administration, largely for issues left over from the Obama administration. And there's, there's mm -hmm. a few exceptions that the EPA, we've had to see the EPA. We, we just do that regularly. <laughs> um, but yeah, mostly Obama policies. And for instance, okay. we filed... Uh, two Obamacare lawsuits against the federal government. We've already won one of those, getting a return to the taxpayers of Texas of $305 million, uh, just what they owe us back, and, and also preventing us from having to pay these ridiculous Obamacare taxes. What am I missing there? I, I kind of feel <laughs> with Obama, yes, you're going to have to sue the Obama administration. I get that to affect change. But can't you just pick up the phone and call President Trump and say, this is wrong. We're about to sue you. Can we just find another way to resolve this? Well, you know, it's interesting. In, in some cases, yes. we They've been very cooperative in either ending lawsuits, and it, but we've had to sue because it takes, you know, there's so many things that Obama changed that were, were wrong or unconstitutional. And it, it's just the magnitude. They, he really, in, it was just all through all levels of government. So it's really hard for a president to change all of that overnight. So one of the motivating factors to get it higher on their list is to sue him. And so <laughs> as an example, Obamacare and DACA, we sued on both of those. And the president, you know, I spoke to him a couple of times. He goes, look, we don't think this, we agree with you. We're not going to defend those lawsuits. And so okay, literally right. the federal government came in on our side and California and New Jersey came in on the other side. They intervened. So these, so these other states come in and fight the fight that the, the president says is, is, a, is a fight. We're not going to fight. That's interesting. That's, that's amazing. So on DACA, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals just said that President Trump doesn't have the authority to undo, undo DACA. Um, what, what do you make of that? That's insane. I mean, it's an executive order done by a president illegally, and now they're telling a the president he can't undo an executive order. It, that would be it's, it, judges stepping into the shoes of the president. And so I don't think there's any way that stands. This, we won our first lawsuit on DAPA. Uh, we took that to the U.S. Supreme now, Court. What is, what is that? That was the original lawsuit on immigration where they, they, they gave basically amnesty to about four or five million non-children, parents. And we took that all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, not so much based on the policy of it, but the fact that the president can't just make up law. I mean, right. if we're, we're going to go down that path, we might as well just throw the Constitution in the trash. So we defended, we went after that based on the fact that the president had done, some, Obama had done something unconstitutional. We won. And so this DACA lawsuit has the exact same um, facts same legal arguments, and so ultimately we should be successful in that as well. So given the current composition of the U.S. Supreme Court, um, that we're, should we're, get overturned. Yeah, we're optimistic. We, we, okay. we won at the Fifth Circuit last night. We won at trial court. We won at the Fifth Circuit. And then when we took the U.S. Supreme Court, Scalia had passed away, so there were only eight justices. So the four liberal judges said, yes, the president has the authority to change any, basically any law he wants to, because this he clearly did. And then we had the other four we, with Kennedy, and so the tie gave us the, the win. So, you know, I would anticipate that the, the two new justices would agree that it's Congress's purview to change law. That's obviously what our founders set up, not the president. Right. So President Trump has been able to make two appointments to the U.S. Supreme Court in his first term. Um, 
do you think it's likely he'll, he will appoint more or have the potential possibility to appoint more? And then how, how important is that overall? So it's pretty important. Uh, it depends on whether he has another term. You know, it's possible we lose another Supreme Court justice. Obviously, Ginsburg is you know, 85, and there's a couple others that are in their 80s. I think mm-hmm. there's at least one other. Breyer, I think, is 80. Right. So, you know, certain age, it, more likely that people retire. So, you know, Trump told me that he thought that he'd ultimately get to a point five. So, hmm. which it, would be a record, I think. Oh yeah, it would. I think it'd be a record, other than maybe George Washington. Right. Yeah. Okay. So back to the immigration thing. We've got a caravan of uh, refugees, if that's the right term, uh, making their way from Central America to the U.S. Mm-hmm. border. How should tr- President Trump handle that? Well. When he was here in Texas a couple weeks ago, he told me and Governor Abbott and Dan Patrick, Ted Cruz, that he wasn't going to let him in. And he is using a statute, which is very clear. It says the statute was passed years ago by Congress, and it says that the president has the authority to restrict the entry of any class of non-resident aliens that he views as detrimental to the country. So if he views them as detrimental to the country, he can stop them from coming in. And if he does, there's no doubt there will be a lawsuit over that, I suspect. Look, and it's the, it's the same theory that he used in the travel ban. If you'll remember, he used the same statute. It was actually a statute that we suggested in our brief to the Ninth Circuit when they found a special constitutional right to due process for non-citizens, right. which is ridiculous. Uh, same, same argument. The Supreme Court in this case called Trump versus Hawaii on the travel ban said, yes, the president has the ability to restrict entry. He can do it when he wants, whether he wants to who he wants, uh, under what conditions he wants, and how he wants. So it's a very broad, uh, and the Supreme Court, you know, it was a 5-4 decision, gave, basically upheld a statute that Congress had passed years ago. Right. And by the way, there have been, what, 44 other travel bans by other presidents that were never challenged? This is the first time anybody's ever challenged any president. Well, we definitely live in interesting times, no doubt, politically speaking. Would you say that our immigration policy as a nation is broken? And if so, I mean, what, what, do, we, what do we do about it? Because it doesn't seem like the people on the left side of the spectrum agree with the right side of the spectrum and vice versa. Well, you know, I, I definitely think it's broken. We ought to have a policy that, that is beneficial to our country. We ought to think about who do we want in our country. If we need more workers at, at, for certain jobs, we ought to bring those people in. If we want sort of higher level employees, we got to bring them in. We got to have a strategic initiative to bring in the people that will benefit our country. We, if we have an open border, we get two problems. One is it'll bankrupt the country because we can't afford it. Two, uh, you know, it's a security risk. And so I definitely think Congress should do something. I don't think the left or the Democrats will do anything about it because they don't really want to fix it. They want to be able to say that you know, it's it's the Republicans' fault for not for, for it not happening. And so they'd rather use it as a campaign issue because President Trump offered up a compromise on DACA if they would if they would negotiate on other things like border security and they refused. Right. Because they wanted it as an election issue. I, I don't know what you can do. If the Democrats refuse, you have to have help, help it has to be there has to be some working together. And the Democrats at some point, hopefully, will decide that they want to actually get something done instead of just run campaigns every two years. Well, so that beg- begs a question. The Democrats took back control of the U.S. House. So how likely is it that anything gets done? You know, I'm not optimistic because the Democrats have a history of not wanting to get anything done. They, they would rather fight, investigate, make uh, life miserable for the president. If that's the choice, that they're not benefiting the country. Right. Hopefully they'll make a different choice. I understand when you've got split um, Congresses, you're going to have to negotiate and you're going to have to come up with compromises that people agree on. But in the past, you know, our country has worked well having a divided government. Sure. And there's no reason it can't work now. It just means we have to compromise. But if, pe- if, if the Democrats are unwilling, then I guess we're going to go two years and get nothing done, which is unfortunate for the American people. Well, and I think a good example of what you just said is President Clinton and, and Newt Gingrich, when he was speaker, they worked well together. They got um, welfare reform passed. They got tax reform passed. They got a lot of things passed. There's no doubt. Uh, President Clinton was, he's pragmatic and apparently wanted to get a few things done while he was in office and realized that if he had a Republican Congress, he had to work with them. And that that has not been uncommon in our history. It's just become uncommon, particularly you know, honestly, since President Obama. Um, and even when George Bush was there, the Democrats didn't seem to want to work with him. But under Obama, he just decided Congress was irrelevant, and he just started making up his own laws. Right. 
Right. So I, I have to ask you, uh, si sitting in the studio with us this morning is your lovely wife, Angela, who is now uh, in January will be sworn in as a Texas senator. Did you have anything to do with that? It was mostly her. I mean, I, I certainly encouraged her, did everything I could to help, but she worked extremely hard. Um, she's an she was an excellent candidate, and uh, I'm convinced that had it not been her, we wouldn't have saved that seat because it was a, it was a close race. So, um, you know, she deserves most of the credit. So, does she ask you for political advice, or do you ask her for political advice? Well. Most of my life I've been asking her for political <laughs> advice. Um, now that she's in, sometimes she asks me for political advice. I, I would think that makes for interesting pillow talk. Oh yeah, we, yeah. we, uh, we have um, a lot of interesting topics to discuss. Um, and having someone in the legislature and me and my job, it, 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 I think it'll be fun. So in addition to wanting some additional funding or just funding at a period <laughs> for, for the human trafficking initiative, what else uh, do you want to see the legislature accomplish next session? Well, one, I'd like them to also help us with uh, voter fraud. We have okay. very minimal resources to, to, to go after that. The narrative has always been there's no voter fraud. That is not true. We, we see it rampant in Texas. And if we had resources, initially we had one prosecutor and, and one investigator funded by the legislature. It's not enough. Um, Governor Abbott was generous and gave us a grant for a two-year um, position for another prosecutor, another investigator, so that's helped us. But we need more resources. If we're gonna protect the democracy and we're gonna protect voting, right. we've gotta be able to go after it and, and send the message that you can't do this in Texas. There are, there are penalties, and we've done that. We've done, in the last two years, we, I think we've had more prosecutions than there were over the last 10. Right. So you've got another four-year term ahead of you. Um, in addition to human trafficking, voter fraud, what else do you wanna accomplish in those four years? So, I mean, I think we're still going to be working, this is actually kind of nice, instead of suing the president, we're going to be working with the federal government on some of those issues nationally, like human trafficking is going to be an issue. Um, we're going to be working with them on, you know, border security issues. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to having that relationship because it's worked well over the last two years to get a lot of things done. Um, you know, when the EPA came out with these regulations that were going to affect the oil and gas industry, I was able to walk into the EPA administrator at the time, Scott Pruitt, and give them a letter from 11 Republican attorneys general saying this is ridiculous and the next day these regulations that had no benefit and cost a lot of money were repealed. And so I think that relationship is going to benefit Texas. I, th I think it will. So what is the website address, if you know off the top of your head, if somebody wa wants to watch the human trafficking? TexasAttorneyGeneral.gov. Okay. And so it's easy to find it from there? Yep. Okay. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, I always appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, it's going to be an interesting legislative session, yes, interesting next four years, um, and w we look forward to staying in touch. As you well know, we, we like to end each episode with words of wisdom from our, our guests. Uh, typically, that's either a, a quote from somebody or words of wisdom of your own, if, if you have any. So you have something you'd like to well, share? I'll with give you words of wisdom from somebody a lot smarter than me. Okay. Um, it was a Reagan quote, but actually it, he, he got it from Albert Schweitzer, and it's this, there's no limit to what a man or a woman can do if he or she doesn't care who gets the credit. And so, you know, I've always thought about that and, and, and tried to live by that and not focus on getting credit, but actually trying to get something done. And I think if more people would do that over in this Capitol building, we'd get a lot done. Maybe we should etch that <laughs> above the doors. If they would read it. I don't know if they would read it, but if they would read it, I, I think it's a great idea. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, General Paxton, thank you for coming on the show. We look forward to having you back sometime. Thank you all for watching The Trey Blocker Show. You can find us at TreyBlockerShow.com, YouTube, and your favorite podcast app. God bless. This has been The Trey Blocker Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and visit TreyBlockerShow.com to donate so we can keep fighting to restore sanity to this great nation.